Well, we're finally here to rank the top 10 strongest Sternritter in Bleach. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this video, just like the last one. Put a lot of time and research into this to try and get it right. I've been through the list once before. I've even filmed a bit of this video before, before changing the list over again and again. And then we're finally here. And I think I'm pretty happy with this list now. I'm not entirely sure. The good thing about the top 10 Sternritter is, unlike the majority of the last one, these guys actually get a decent amount of screen time for the most part. Most of them have a good amount of abilities and their shifts are pretty well defined. So it does make this list a slightly easier, I think, overall, but there are still some tricky positions in there. But also it makes it more enjoyable. And I think you're going to like this video. I hope you do. Um, let me know, of course, I always enjoy seeing your rankings in the comments below. And if you haven't seen the last video already, we ranked every Sturmator from number 27 right down to 11 to get ready for this video. So I implore you go and watch that one first if you haven't seen it already. And before we get into this video, guys, uh, I just want to say, wasn't I on a thousand subs like a week ago? I really thought I was going to get more mileage out of that 1k subs video, but I just can't thank you guys enough. Um, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, I think, but just the channel has been growing like mad. And I constantly am just getting so much support from you guys. And I just really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate that this channel is becoming everything I always wanted it to. It's a place to talk about Bleach, uh, you know, the franchise that we all love so much. And I think you guys, you keep supporting me, I'm able to keep supporting Bleach, and it's just it's just going to be a great time while we wait for the anime to come back. So, yeah, I just wanted to give a quick thanks to everyone who has helped this channel grow so tremendously over the last three months. Right, let's get on with the top ten list then. No more waiting around. Really interested to see what you guys think. As always, leave your own rankings in the comments below. I'm really keen to see how we agree and how we differ. I'm not expecting everyone to agree with every position on this list, although I do think the general consensus on the last list was... You know, pretty good. Or well, I completely, actually completely agree with some of you guys who had differing opinions on the rankings. I can totally see them. They all made sense. So let's do the top 10 list now and we'll just see how, how we go. I'm really excited for this list. As it was with the last one, the power difference between the top guys at the top and the guys at the bottom is just a massive gulf. Um, and honestly, like the top sort of six guys, the top five guys have powers that verge on the divine which honestly made it kind of difficult to rank them towards the end. But like I said, it's, they're, they're an interesting bunch. They've got some really cool abilities. So without further ado, here's number 10. So when the Vandenreich first invaded, I really enjoyed their aesthetic. I thought they came across as cold, calculating, ruthless and militaristic. And a bunch of these characters really kind of helped reinforce that idea, as not Kang do, BG9, just a bunch of really kind of sinister looking characters. And then a luchador shows up. Yes, number 10 on my list, the 10th strongest Sturmritter is Sturmritter S, the superstar, Mask Demasculine. Now, I certainly didn't expect Mask to be this high when I first saw him in Bleach. I thought he was going to be a total goofball. But actually, it turns out that while he kind of is, he's an incredibly powerful one. The superstar is a ridiculously broken ability. When I was researching this list, a friend of mine actually mentioned that Mask's superstar shrift is actually like a miniature version of the miracle, and I can totally see that. While Mask doesn't really use traditional Quincy abilities outside of the Volston dig, the superstar more than makes up for it, and it has almost limitless potential. In the last video, when I was impressed by Kurge or Kielge, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, but I appreciate everyone who's trying to help me out there. I was impressed at the fact that Kurge was able to take on Lowly, Menoli, the Trebestias, and Aeon, but Mask really kicks it up a notch. In quick succession, Mask is able to defeat Ikaku, Yumichika, Hisagi, Bankai Kensei, and Bankai Rose, and then he's finally put down by a kind of overpowered Renji. Yeah, this fight really demolishes the Bleach power scaling, or what was left of it anyway, because the characters just become so absurd towards the end. Masks the superstar ability is personified by James, a strange, amorphous, uh, immortal kind of person thing. I know a lot of people theorise that James is the true Sternritter or that Mask's real name is James. Either way, this guy is really weird. He doesn't seem to be able to be killed, although he does seem to die at the end. So there's a lot of unanswered questions there as well. But either way, James is the source of Mask's power. Every time he cheers him on, Mask grows stronger by a seemingly unquantifiable amount, but it's enough to give him a serious power boost to go from not being able to defeat Bankai Kensei to absolutely annihilating him. 
Mask's power level just goes seemingly so far off the charts that it's completely ridiculous. Plus, the superstar can actually heal him as well, such as when he restores his eardrums to their former glory, as he says. The fact that Mask goes from defeating a bunch of vice-captain to captain-level characters with ease, to then taking on two Bankai Vizards, struggling a little bit, then gaining a power boost to the point where he can crush them both, then gaining three more power boosts but still losing to Renji, is just really, really weird, but there's no denying that Mask goes on an absolutely triumphant series of victories before finally losing, and I think there's no way we can deny that this guy is definitely one of the top Sturmritters. Just from power level and the amount of destruction he causes, I think he finally loses eventually because he loses sight of who he is and what he thinks he's fighting for, this idea of justice, um, and he, he does seemingly kill James with the Star Flash supernova ability, so... I think that's probably his undoing in the end, but there's no denying that Mask is absurdly powerful with seemingly limitless potential. The ninth strongest Sternritter on this list is the fan favourite Sternritter H, the Heat, Basby. Now, Basby is an interesting character. Of all the Sternritter, he appears the most apart from Hashwolf, but he doesn't really get a proper fight. Now, he gets two battles, admittedly. He fights Hitsugaya at the start of the second invasion, and then he fights Hashwolf towards the end of the arc. But both of these fights are on such extreme opposite ends of the scale that it's really difficult to actually place this guy. He's able to utterly demolish Hitsugaya when Hitsugaya is in Shikai, to the point where I don't think Hitsugaya really lands a hit on him that actually hurts Basby. On the other end, when Basby fights Hashwolf, he's so utterly destroyed by him that he's clearly definitely not at that level. So where do you place him? Now, Basby has some really cool abilities and fire has been done a lot in this series, but I actually think Kubo is at his most creative with this element, with Basby. And I think the application of fire here is really well done. Burner fingers one, two, three, and four, burning full fingers and burning stomp all have completely unique abilities, each one seemingly more destructive than the last. Let's also not forget that Basby is the one who takes out Kira and he seems to kills him in one shot. And I know Kira's not dead, but he's taken out of the entire war pretty much by what appears to be a burner finger one. It could be a high leg file, but I think the idea is that it become the it becomes a burner finger one. So Basby is clearly, clearly above Vice Captain, clearly above Shikai Captain, and I think Basby even mentions to Hitsugai that he could defeat his Bankai with just one finger. And with the way Burner Finger 1 snipes Hitsugaya, I could kind of believe it. But perhaps the most important aspect of what Basby achieves is the way he tanks a direct point-blank hit from Yamamoto Shikai. And not only does he do that, but he also protects and saves the lives of two other Sturmitters with him. That is an irrefutable in-manga fact, and it really gives us a great idea of how powerful Basby's flames actually are. He comes out of Yamamoto's attack not that worse for where you do see him standing up again after. He's able to defend himself and Az and Nanana, and they all come out of it alive. I'm not saying Basby is as strong as Ryujin Jacker because he's probably not, but his flames are undeniably very impressive, so I think putting him at ninth on this list is only fair. Eighth place is where things start getting a little bit weird. We have the other yourself brother, Roid Lloyd. I said it before in the last video that I really don't like the yourself brothers. I think their powers are nonsense. They barely even make sense. And the Roid Lloyd twist, if you can even call it that, is really lazy and it kind of comes out of nowhere. I personally would have loved to have seen Yuha defeat Yamamoto with his own powers, with his own strength. That would have made him appear way more fearsome, I think. And as the almighty Quincy King, I think he probably could have done it. Instead, though, we've got Roid Lloyd. So while the two brothers can take the appearance of someone else, only Roid takes the personality and the memories of the person they take, which is how he's able to recognise characters like Zedrix and Hubert when Yamamoto uses his Bankai. However, nowhere does it say that Roid takes the powers of the person he is mimicking. So how on earth is he able to stand up to Yamamoto's Bankai unless he's doing so of his own virtue? This is when things get really weird. Royd is able to apparently beat up Kenpachi without his eye patch, without taking a hit. Are we supposed to believe that he's just that strong a Quincy? It comes out of nowhere, and there's no indication that a Quincy of that strength should even really exist outside of the Schutzstoffel. Now, there is a fan theory that Hashwolf or Yuha is actually feeding Royd power to give the illusion of the fact that he is as strong as Yuha. I don't know about that, it's never mentioned in the manga, it, very, it could be very possible, um, but either way we have to go off what we can see, and Royd, while imitating Yuha, is able to beat up Kenpachi and withstand Yamamoto's Bankai. 
However, one thing that's important that I think people tend to forget about the Royd fight is that when Yamamoto activates his Bankai, Royd is really on the defensive. He doesn't achieve anything against Zanka no Tachi. He tries to attack it at one point, his sword is annihilated. When the skeletons come out of the ground, he's basically on the defensive, getting beaten up by them. And when Yamamoto uses North, it cleaves Royd in two, no questions asked. So the truly impressive part here is, this, is the simple fact that Royd's able to survive in the vicinity of Zanka no Tachi. And that's, of course, absolutely no mean feat. And clearly Yamamoto believed him enough to think that he was Yuha. So either Royd is being given power somehow, or it's just his own innate strength that he can pull off these Quincy spells, throw a high league file that looks like Yuha's, and just overall be incredibly durable. So I think putting him at eighth is fair, but he's a really weird character to rank. So I knew there'd be some controversy with this list, and I think place number seven is going to be the start of it. But I'd like to defend myself. I'd like to see what you guys think about this positioning and uh, hear me out. Sturmritter number seven on this list is Sturmritter A, the antithesis and the successor to the Vandenreich, Uryu Ishida himself. Uryu is an incredibly weird character in the final arc, an arc that's supposed to focus on him, and he's barely in it. He takes up this really cool role infiltrating the Vandenreich, and Yuha promises to the Sternritters that we will eventually see the power of Uryu that makes him worthwhile of the Sternritters' successor title, but we never see that power. It never materialises in an actual fight, because Uryu is given nothing to do. Now, we know from the get-go that Hashwath doesn't trust Uryu, and it's likely that Yuha doesn't really either, as Hashwath comments that the whole successor setup is basically designed to put the spotlight on Uryu and make it so that he can't achieve anything. But Uryu is still supposed to be incredibly powerful and likely received a massive power boost after drinking Yuha's blood and receiving his shrift. Obviously, we've spent way more time with Uryu throughout the series than we have with the rest of the Sturmitters, so we know, at least before the time skip, that Uryu is capable of taking on a Priveron Espada and also duking it out pretty successfully with characters like Yami. Uryu also goes up against Segunda Etapa Ulkiora, but he doesn't seem to be really trying against Uryu, and he does take off his hand pretty easily. Flash forward then, and Uryu must have attained a pretty significant power boost, becoming a Sternritter, to the point where Yuha is pretty confident about bringing Uryu to the Royal Palace and helping him with his acquisition of the Soul King's powers. Uryu is also accepted into the Schutzstoffel by Gerard, which would seem to be some kind of acknowledgement of strength. And yet, when Uryu faces off with Hashwolf, he gets completely destroyed on a similar level to Basby. Hashwolf just completely annihilates this guy. Uryu can't fight back. He does a couple of... He, I think he draws his bowstring at one point. That's the best you get out of him. This is partly Kubo's fault for not giving this fight the spotlight it deserved. But Uryu does nothing to impress me and tell me that he actually deserves a spot higher on this list. Now let's discuss the antithesis, because that's clearly the bulk of Uryu's power, and it's undeniably a very strong shrift. It enables him to reverse anything that has occurred between two people, such as when Hashwath seriously damages Uryu, Uryu antithesis, and Hashwath gets hit by the damage instead. I don't really like abilities like this, they're incredibly vague about what their limits are, and a couple of the Sturmitters had powers like this, especially towards the end of the series. Uryu's power doesn't seem to have any limits, I assume he can antithesize as many times as he wants, and keep reflecting things that happen between people. Now, is the antithesis the power that Yuha spoke of when he said that Uryu had something that can overcome his power? But even then, was he talking about the Almighty, or was he just talking about the Auswalan because Uryu survived that as a child? Uryu doesn't really have any feats to speak of in the final arc that would really help his argument. He performs a pretty impressive Licked Regen, but it is blocked by Orohime. And admittedly, this is the same Orohime who does defend against Yuha's almighty attacks as well, so that's not really a knock against Uryu, but he doesn't really do anything else in the final arc to warrant any kind of higher ranking. And the sixth strongest Sturmitter on this list is actually my favourite one, and that's Sturmitter D, the death-dealing Askin Naklavar. Now, Askin is the only one of the Schutzstoffel to have been promoted from below, which implies that he's not immediately as powerful as the other members, and I think that's probably fair enough. Askin's personality, the fact that he likes to kind of remain out of fights, he's a follower, he's not a leader, he doesn't use the initiative, he likes to hang back, implies to me, at least, that he doesn't particularly like physical confrontation. Luckily for him, the death dealing doesn't really deal with any of that, and it actually has a huge swath of abilities that we can get into now. 
So the death dealing actually seems to work on three different fronts. It has the normal ability where he's able to essentially adjust the lethal dosage of something by ingesting something into his body. So against Oetsu, for instance, Askin drinks his own blood and therefore he's able to adjust the lethal dose of Oetsu's blood. Not only that, if Askin takes in some kind of Reiatsu, such as when he gets hit by Yusuro's Bakuen Muso attack, he's able to then gain complete immunity to that afterwards, which is completely absurd. Another facet of the death dealing gives Askin a bunch of physical attacks, such as the Gift Ball, the Gift Ring, the Gift Ball Deluxe, and the Gift Bereich. And finally, Askin can go so far as to heal his own wounds once he's acquired immunity to Reiatsu, such as what he does after he gets hit by Yushiro's attack. As a character, Askin always comments about being far away from death's door, and this is all part of his immunity, and I think it makes him an incredibly difficult opponent to fight. The fact that he's able to poison characters has enabled him to defeat many opponents in this series, going from Grimjo to Orohime to Chad to Yoroichi to Yushiro, and then he even severely poisons Urahara and Grimjo on his deathbed. Askin's a real tricky one because his ability is very devious, it's also incredibly potent. The poison he's able to generate is enough to wipe out captain level opponents with apparently no effort required whatsoever. His Volsten Dig only enhances this power further, with stuff like Gift Ring destroying Urahara's eye like it's absolutely nothing. Askin, however, is definitely not a physical fighter, as I mentioned before. Urahara is able to outpace him quite easily when he starts using his Bankai, slices through Askin's shoulder, then gets behind him and uses his Bankai's power even more to amplify his strength and send Askin flying. And it's at this point that Askin comments that he doesn't really like physical fighting. Not only that, but Askin doesn't seem to be able to acquire immunity to physical attacks, such as when Oetsu manages to cut him. But Askin's analytical side is shown off here, as he's the only one of the elites to manage to time his dodge correctly and avoid Oetsu's first strike. Despite Askin being clearly a guy with absolutely loads of abilities and one of the strongest shrifts in the series, there is one thing that lets him down, and it's kind of a funny one. Basically, he is not a god. A lot of the Schutzstaffel are on godlike level. They are, they are divine, they are immortal. Askin is not, despite being very powerful, he's a pretty regular guy. And yeah, he can survive quite a bit more than your average guy. He is the definition of a tank. But when Grimjo comes up behind him and rips out his heart, that's it for him. There's no coming back, there's no additional transformation, there's no angel transformation. He just dies. And I think it's definitely that that kind of holds him back as far as the top sort of five, top three positions go. I just don't think that despite his vast library of abilities, he would necessarily be able to keep up with someone like Lille or someone like Gerard or Pernida who can evolve and change constantly, no matter what is thrown at them. So I think sixth place is pretty fair for my favourite Sermitor. I think he's definitely very, very powerful, very, very skilled. We see him using bow and arrow, we see him using physical combat against Yoroichi, and his ability allows him to wipe out captain level fighters like they're nothing. But I think when it comes to an endurance fight, someone against someone higher up in these ranks, Askin probably doesn't quite make the cut. Okay, moving on to the top five strongest Sternritter, and this is another one that I think might be controversial, but again, allow me to fight my corner on this one, because I do think it's a fair point. So number five on this list is the Grand Master of the Sternritter himself, Sternritter B, the Balance, Jugram Hashwolf. Of all the characters on this list, Hashwolf is probably the single weirdest one to rank, in my opinion. As the Grand Master, you would assume he probably is the strongest one of them all. He has powers and abilities, but actually he doesn't really. Kubo doesn't give this guy a chance to properly shine. I'll give him that. And out of Hashwalth's two fights, they're both pretty short, and they both don't really involve an awful lot of on-screen fighting. Hashwalth just completely annihilates Basby, and he completely annihilates Uru, so he's definitely stronger than those two. The vast majority of info we have on this guy comes from his flashback. We know that he's a unique type of Quincy who instead gives power to others and can't generate his own powers. So he probably can't generate a bow, he probably doesn't have a Volsten dig, but he does have a shrift. We also know that he's been honing his swordsmanship skills since he was a young boy, which I think is how he outplays Basby so easily. Uh, he's just so incredibly skilled with the blade. Clearly, this strength with a sword is there to make up for the fact that he doesn't have normal Quincy powers. Although at one point, he does seem to fire an energy blast at Uryu, so I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. Whether Hashoth got some amount of his powers at some point, I don't know, but 
The whole fight with Uryu is just very, very nebulous. So Hashwolf has three things, in my opinion, that make him worthy of a top five spot, but probably not the highest peak. I don't think he was made Grandmaster because of his incredible power. I think he was made Grandmaster because of his relationship with Yuha, but he's clearly well respected among the Sternritter. He's clearly a battle veteran. Like I said, he'd been training since a young age, and he can just completely manhandle powerful Quincy like Basby with the sword. His shrift, the balance, is also just ridiculously overpowered. Essentially, he can take someone's good fortune and reverse it into misfortune, which is basically a way of saying if someone gets lucky or someone manages to hit Hashwolf, Hashwolf can take that, increase his own strength, and deal an equal amount of damage back to them while removing it from himself. Yeah, it's all kind of pretty weird. If you look at the Kang Du example, base Hashwolf is not able to damage Kang Du's iron. However, he takes that good fortune, turns it into the balance, and then he's able to just cleave through Kang like it was nothing. So I have to assume that Hashworth's balance works on a case-by-case -case basis. I assume he approaches every fight in his base form, and then is powered up by good fortune and misfortune as the fight plays out. We can also see him using his equipment in a fight with Uri when he brings out the Frunz shield, and I believe the way that works is it collects good fortune over time, and builds and builds and builds until Hashwolf chooses to release it in an even stronger attack. So Hashwolf's The Balance is undeniably very, very powerful as a shrift. It pretty much means that he's able to counter most attacks in the series. However, I just don't think that Hashwolf has, again, like Askin, the capabilities to keep up with the godlike level at the top of this list. Guys like Gerard and Lil, we know they are basically immortal gods. Hashwolf, I don't think, is. Again, like Askin, I think he's a relatively normal Quincy, apart from obviously the fact that he gives power instead of takes it, but I think he's a pretty normal human. Even when Yuha goes to sleep and Hashwolf takes on the Mask of the Ruler and gains the power of the Almighty, it's not the full power of the Almighty. It allows him to see the future but not alter it. I don't really think the Almighty in this sense would help Hashwolf that much against the guys at the top of this list, because even if he can see the future, what can he do about it? We also know that Hashwolf is not able to master the Almighty. Uryu says that his change in nature surprised Hashwolf, despite Hashwolf being apparently able to see into the future. And it's something that Hashwolf confesses himself. Hashwolf also fights Uryu during the night and isn't able to kill him. It's again something that Uryu mentions himself. And Hashwolf says that his own powers are more suited to fighting than Yuha's, which I'm not entirely sure how that works because the Almighty is probably the most broken ability in the series. But... I don't think that being able to see the future really helps Hashworth against the very top guys. I think basically he relies on his overwhelming physical strength and skill, his dexterity, the balance being incredibly powerful. And yeah, the Almighty gives him a little bit of a boost as well. But I think fifth place is fair for Hashworth. Let me know what you guys think in the comments because Hashworth is probably the one I'm most interested in finding out about because he is just so... He's a mystery. We don't know really anything about what this guy can do beyond being an incredible swordsman. Okay, the fourth strongest Sturmitter on this list. This one is Sturmitter C, the compulsory Pernida Parker Jazz. Now, the left arm of the Soul King is essentially a godlike being in and of itself, and we really get to see that in its fight against Miuri. Pernida is able to put down Kenpachi with ease. It doesn't even have to move to defeat Kenpachi. Its compulsory ability is that powerful. Now, the compulsory, much like the death dealing, takes on quite a number of different forms, but predominantly it's focused on this idea of continual progress, continual evolution. We know that Miyuri is the king of counters. I mean, how many other characters are going to have a Bankai that allow it to shed its own skin to avoid the effects of the compulsory? And even so, Pernida keeps up with Miyuri on an evolutionary scale, continually adapting to the guy who continually adapts. Pernida can do absolutely crazy things, like break off its own fingers to grow entirely new arms. This, this character is just insane on a level that just keeps on building. It builds and builds and builds, and it's not really like anything we've ever seen in Bleach before. And I actually think this fight is easily one of the arc's best because of the pressure that Miyuri comes under. I'd also like to point out that Pernida is the only one of the Schutzstoppel to actually kill someone, it manages to kill Nemu, uh, and it's because Pernita just apparently is another one of these characters that basically can't die. Nemu blows it to smithereens, but they all become sentient. And again, I think that's really, really cool. I haven't even touched on the nerve aspect of this character. If it even touches you in the slightest, you, as Miuri puts it in the translations, turn to just an absolute mess. 
We've seen it happen quite a few times. This is exactly what happens to Ken Patchy. The compulsory's nerve abilities, the moment it touches you, your body will just contort wildly until there's nothing you can do about it apart from ripping off your own arms or whatever happens to you. Pernida is easily one of the scariest foes I think anyone has ever fought in Bleach. It's just purely a thing of continuous pressure. If you damage Pernida, it will continue to evolve. Miuri blows off its little finger, it becomes an entirely new hand. It's another one of these characters that is basically impossible to kill. Miuri gets incredibly lucky that Nemu has this fast growth agent which basically causes Pernida to constantly blow up and then regrow and blow up and regrow. So I assume Pernida is essentially trapped like that. I think, I can't remember exactly, can't for your own world, maybe mentions that Miuri gets a piece of it for research. I don't remember entirely. But what's important here is that Pernida is nigh on impossible to kill, nigh on impossible to keep up with. And I actually think is one of the cooler, more unique ways to showcase a divine ability in Bleach. I also think Pernida is a skilled Quincy, able to use its own bow and arrow, able to use multiple bow and arrows at the top of each of its fingers. I actually really liked this character. I thought it made for a fantastic battle, and I think it easily deserves its spot in the top four. Possibly the coolest thing about Pernida is the way it can copy abilities as well. My actual favourite Pernida moment is when it sheds its skin based on the ability of Miuri's new Bankai, Matai Fuquin Shodai. That is the moment where I thought Miuri might actually die, where he was completely out of options, completely caught off guard, and Pernida nearly took him out. And I, I really liked that moment. It really showcased just how scary this character was. Miuri had thrown everything at this guy, but he just continually adapts and gets around it. So that was a really cool moment. Okay, we're here at the top three. We're almost there. And number three on this list is pretty much just here because his power is obscene. <laughs> We've never seen anything like this in Bleach before. And you probably guessed it just by me saying that, but it's Sturm to V the Visionary, Gremmy Thumo. I think it's pronounced Thumo. I don't actually know, but it's Gremmy. So Gremmy is an odd character. I've mentioned this before in my original reviews of the series, but it's really weird how he exists in a vacuum. Really, he's only here so that Kenpachi can reveal Nozarashi. Gremmy is revealed in Volume 64, and he dies in Volume 64, but he actually has a pretty long fight. He's a weird one. I think it's undeniable that the Visionary is probably the strongest ability we've ever seen in Bleach. Maybe the Completed Almighty is stronger than that. But the Visionary literally allows Gremmy to imagine something, and it will happen. There's no limits to it. There's no rules to it. Gremmy can just imagine creating life and it will happen. He creates life with Gwenael and Shaz and himself. He creates another version of himself multiple times. He also brings the void of space on Kenpachi, and it just keeps on coming. Lava, giant statues, uh, a wave of machine guns. Gremmy can literally do it all. So if Gremmy is powerful enough to the point where he can just, you theoretically imagine someone dying, how is he only third on the list? Well, and this one falls specifically on the character's personality. Gremmy quite simply doesn't know how to fight. He doesn't have the mind of a fighter at all, and you can't really blame him. Yuha has kept him locked in a cage beneath Silburn his entire life. This is pretty much the first time he's ever been allowed out. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to win because he is essentially lethargic to the idea of fighting. And I really liked this character turn, I thought it was really cool, and it was awesome as well to give Kenpachi a chance at mentoring someone during a fight. Eventually Gremmy does want to fight and he does want to win, but again his inexperience completely gets the better of him, and he ends up accidentally tearing himself apart. Despite that, Gremmy is a really interesting character to watch as he grows throughout the fight with Kenpachi, using more and more crazy abilities over time to try and get rid of this guy. He's able to do things like completely remove the damage he's taken, make himself impervious to damage, just anything he wants he can do, but it's really interesting how Kubo seeds his downfall into the fight. This guy has an unstoppable ability, but his childlike mind, his inexperience, really just leads to his downfall, especially at that one point where Kenpachi is able to get the better of him because he's so fast, Gremmy starts getting pretty scared about that, despite the fact that he could easily stop him, but he gets overwhelmed. And I think that's absolutely key uh, to Gremmy's eventual defeat and the fact that he is only, I say only, but he is third on this list. And Kenpachi even has to warn him about imagining himself dying. So despite the fact that Gremmy can conjure a meteor that is strong enough to destroy the entire Seireite, in my opinion, third is absolutely fine for this character. 
due to the fact he, he lacks the battle experience that the other two guys have. All right, top two guys. If you've made it this far into the video, I really, really appreciate your support. Give the video a like if you enjoyed what you see. Every like helps us get recommended and increases the exposure. Um, so yeah, it's all completely helpful. Now, with the top two, this was the biggest debate I had coming into this video. I did not know whether to put Lil Barrow or Gerard Valkyrie in the number one spot. And there's a reason for that. These guys are actually quite similar. They're both clearly designed to be demigods. They are archangels. They are the end game bad guys. They are the most powerful villains we have ever seen in Bleach outside of like Yuha and Hogyoku Aizen. But in terms of like mooks, these guys are the cream of the crop. They basically can't die. Both of them get their heads removed during their fight and they both of them come back from it. Both of them are referenced as being godly, angelic beings. Gerard even sprouts massive feathery wings at one point to be really on the nose about it. And Lil even looks like a seraphim, like a monster. So I really didn't know who to put at the top. However, I have come up with an answer. And so these are the top two strongest Sturmritter in the Vandenreich. The second strongest Sturmritter on this list is Sturmritter X, the X-axis Lil Barrow. Now, Lil is the absolute definition of an unstoppable monster. We've never seen anything like this in this series. He is unkillable, essentially. He is, he, you can't even hurt him most of the time. And Kubo essentially had to invent something in the lore to get rid of this guy. And he is the closest thing we have seen to an actual god, an actual angel in the series, probably since Aizen. But even then, I think Lil is more of a literal version of that. Even in his base form, Lil is incredibly skilled. His power, the X-axis, allows him to destroy anything between two targets. There's no bullet or anything like that. It's essentially just erased from existence. And when he's got his power unlocked, Lil is able to make very short work of even the Zero Division. He goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Captain Commander, Kyoraku Shunsui, going so far as being able to dodge his Kagioni without even really knowing it was coming first. Although Shunsui does overwhelm him in his Shikai, forcing Lil into Volsendig. But I think that's fair enough. I think the second strongest Sturmitter, who, by the way, says he is the closest to God because he was the first one given a shrift, is able to keep up with the Shikai Captain Commander. That's fair enough. When he goes into his Volsendig, however, it is an entirely different story, and Lil becomes, frankly, unstoppable. Much in the way his X-axis can break through anything, once he transforms, nothing can break through him. He cannot be hurt by any kind of physical ability, and that includes Kido. He's also able to teleport, and it is a proper teleport, as opposed to Herenkiak, who it's very similar to the way Aizen disappears and reforms. Lil does essentially the same, but he, like, swirls in and out. But Lil was, the idea is that Lil is definitely supposed to be some kind of angelic being at this point. Now, of course, Shinsui's Bankai does push him to his limit again. But again, this is one of the most powerful Bankais in the series that should be a guaranteed kill on almost anyone. It cuts Lil's throat and then blows his head up. Lil's head reforms, however, and he becomes this massive seraphim dragon thing that is even more unstoppable than he already was. He has abilities now like Trompet that can just decimate the entire platform that they're all standing on, and which is like the size of an entire city. And it's at this point where you have to wonder, like, how do you defeat someone like this? Lil is basically a being of pure light at this point. And I actually really like the concept. I thought it was really, really cool. I thought it was handled pretty well by Kubo. It risked going a bit far at points, but I think he held on quite well. But either way, Lil's power at this point is completely almost untouchable. Just by lifting his arm up, he's able to annihilate entire landscapes. And Shinsui is basically forced to use everything at his disposal to beat this guy. And he still isn't able to do it. Only by bringing in the deus ex machina of the Issei sword is Kubo actually able to put this guy away, and it still doesn't kill him. The sword reflects the power of a god that it's facing, you know, confirming that Lil is essentially a godlike divine being at this point. And by doing so, Nanao is able to split Lil into lots of small little birds that go flying down to the Seireite. Now, we don't really know what happens to these guys, but Kira is strong enough to defeat at least some of them, so I imagine also by losing his uh, Heilig Schlein, Lil has lost a considerable amount of his power at this point. I think it's said in Can't For Your Own World that the birds were cleared out of Seireite, but it's not actually implied if they were killed or not. Either way, Lil is very weak at this point. So the Issei Sword is a counter to Lil, seemingly specifically built for this guy, but I imagine 
in the lore there would be more to go into, but the sword does deal with Lil. Um, but apart from that, it seems like it would be impossible to kill this guy. So how then is he not number one? Well, the strongest Sturmritter on this list is Sturmritter M. The Miracle, Gerard Valkyrie. Now, as I've said already, Gerard and Lil share a lot of the same traits. They're both basically godlike figures. They can't really be killed. Gerard is killed three separate times during his fight with the Gote 13. Initially in his base form, Biakia puts a hole through his head, and you can see that because Kubo draws the big hole in the back of the helmet to kill him the first time, but he resurrects. He then gets cut in half by Kenpachi's Bankai straight down the middle, including his head, but he resurrects. And then, through the combined fighting power of Toshiro, Biakia, and Kenpachi, his head is destroyed again, and you better believe he resurrects. This is the one time in this series we've actually seen this. This character cannot die. The miracle allows him to regenerate seemingly endless amount of times. The fact that he comes back three times and then returns again implies that this character just can't be killed. And he's going up against three of the strongest captains in the entire Soul Society, and they are just unable to stop this guy. That's not to say anything about Gerard's other abilities. The fact that his god size puts him up literal titan nothing has ever been bigger than this guy in the series before and it makes him nearly unstoppable to deal with now of course we see that he does have varying degrees of strength he's clearly not able to keep up with kenpachi's bankai initially and whether kenpachi had stayed in that form and been able to beat him down would have been interesting to see but unfortunately we don't get to see it so we have to just take what we can see but gerard is clearly strong enough to match these guys all the way along, thanks to the miracle, bringing him back countless amounts of times. Now, obviously, this is done completely intentionally. I think Gerard is supposed to be the embodiment of God's holy soldier, you know, Yuha's right-hand man, the Quincy who has been bestowed with everything, as Gerard says, the mightiest and fastest of the Quincy of them all. And I think that is really, really evident in what Kubo's going for with the Nordic themes, the Jotun themes, the fact that one of Gerard's best lines, in my opinion, is after he resurrects the second time and he goes to attack Kenpachi, he says something like, even in the face of my own mortality, I would still swing my sword for my god, or something like that. Uh, so Gerard is very clearly supposed to be the holy defender, uh, and his Volstendig Ashtonig is something like the divine judgment of God, or the divine punishment of God, something like that, but he's supposed to be an unstoppable force, and the captains obviously see that. He one-shots Shinji, technically still in his base form, by the way. He hasn't activated Volstendig until he gets cut in half by Kenpachi. So it's really interesting to see him do these things. The miracle is more than just resurrecting him. He can resurrect body parts as well, so he, when his arm gets cut off, it comes back stronger and mightier than ever before. And also, he's just... He's just a completely insane character to think about. And I don't mind Gerard. I actually like... I think the execution is fairly well done. I think once you accept the fact that this character can only be killed by Yuha's Al Shualim, it and which ironically is the miracle that they were all hoping to get, I think it's easier to swallow that a character like this does exist in the Bleach universe because he is on an entirely different level. Now, the reason I put him above Lil... They've both obviously got incredible battle experience. In my opinion, they are far and away the strongest, most dangerous Sturmitter in Yuha's army, designed to be, as I said, his two holy warriors. But I put Lil below Gerard because Lil has an obvious counter. If his power is in some way reflected back at him, or he's able to share wounds, he takes damage. Whereas Gerard, it doesn't matter if he takes damage, he comes back from it. That's the main thing. There's no... Seemingly no benefit to Lil taking damage. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's the point we're at now. We have to look at the benefits of taking hits. Lil gets his arm cut off. If the same thing happens to Gerard, it just comes back mightier than ever before. And it's not even a case of overwhelming Gerard to the point where he can't use the miracle, because apparently even if he's dead, the miracle still reactivates. So, the main reason I put Gerard above Lil is kind of steeped in a little bit of speculation. But let's talk about it. So we know from the fact that despite being unable to be damaged by conventional weapons, Lil can take damage in his Volstendig. And we specifically see that with Shinsui's Bankai 
and it's sharing Woon's first down ability. So what I'm thinking is, how does Hofnung work? We know for a fact that if Gerard's sword is attacked and damaged, it will then translate that damage back onto its attacker in essentially the same way, but obviously scaled up for size. So the reason Kenpachi takes such a massive hit is because Hofnung is so huge and the chip that Kenpachi gives it is obviously relative to Kenpachi's size. So basically what I'm saying is, if Lil and Gerard were to fight, both of them... If Lil were to hit Hofnung and damage it, would it damage Lil? If it does, I think there's no way Lil can ever defeat Gerard because shooting Gerard through the face, he comes back. But if Lil hits Hofnung and it damages himself, I don't think he would win that fight. But we are really talking about a clash of the gods here, a clash of titans who just can pretty much only be tamed by the king himself. Other than that, they are the mightiest of the mighty, really, and I don't know what else to say. Gerard is essentially unstoppable. Whew, and that is it for the top 10 list of Sturmager. I think this video might be longer than the last one somehow, but like I said before we started, we had a lot to talk about this time. Characters who actually had fully fleshed out abilities and movesets. So I hope it was interesting for you guys. I really enjoyed making this top 10 list. I really enjoyed doing the entire ranking. But of course, the main thing is, do you agree with any of what I've said? If you don't, please let me know your rankings in the comments below. Let me know if you if you do agree with some of my placements. How do you feel about Gerard being at the top? Should it have been Lil? Should it have been Hashwolf? Maybe you think the balancer and the almighty is strong enough to put him there. But I'm happy with my list. Uh, I really... I really am happy with it. I did put a lot of thought into it. Like I said, I revised it quite a lot. So let me know in the comments below, guys, if you agree with this act or give the video a thumbs up. It really helps the exposure. And if you haven't subscribed already, then to come and join the uh, community. We'd really appreciate you being here and just keeping the uh, support for Bleach going. That'd be wonderful. All right, guys, but I think I'm losing my voice now. So uh, I am going to head off. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time. See you then. Oh, Kubo, why'd you make so many bad guys?